you want to learn more about effective management, head over to madsingers.com and sign up for my free management training. Welcome to the Mad Singers Management Podcast from madsingers.com, where entrepreneurs and business managers learn and share. If you like the show, don't forget to leave a review. Hello, 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 and welcome back to the Mad Singers Management Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Alan Millen. Welcome, Alan. Thanks. I'm uh, excited to have this conversation with you. Likewise, likewise. And Alan, believe it or not, there is people around the world who don't yet know who you are. Would you mind giving a little <laughs> bit of an introduction so they get more informed? Absolutely. I'm more than happy to extend, extend that network. So uh, the last 25 years, I've really been focused in, the, in, in working with entrepreneurs and leaders and organizations really multi around the world and really helping to elevate their impact as leaders um, and, and integrate a more understanding of their leadership brand and how they can leverage that for their own careers. Um, and in doing so, working not only with a leader, but with their, with their teams, really just to be able to elevate self-awareness and to bring in some of what I think are the really critical competencies in this ever-changing world around management and leadership. And, um, um, you know, the fun part of this story is that when I was 12 years old, my brother was going to be in sales, Scott was going to be a mechanic, Anne-Marie was going to be a teacher, and Beth was going to be a nurse. And I'm like, I'm in trouble because I thought I didn't get the chip. I had no idea. And um, while I may be a late bloomer, I'm very excited to be able to passionately wake up every morning and have the privilege to, to be in partnership with amazing people around the world. That my biggest problem when I when I see people who can lie in bed for eight, nine, ten hours, I'm so jealous because when I wake up, my brain starts and I that's right. I don't I don't want to stay in bed. I want to get going. Right. So go go go. Good for you. That's definitely as long definitely. as as long as you're evoking a pause throughout the day and not um, accelerating. Um, yeah, we'll talk definitely. about that. Good. Definitely. So how how do you impact leaders' impact? What, what's the what's the main sort of focus area when when you're trying to work with leaders and, and really improve their impact? Well, one of the things that's really shifted in the last ten years um, is really uh, recognizing that sort of to your analogy of getting up in the morning and cycling at sixty miles an hour until you hit the pillow at the end of the day. And uh, one of the one of the things that's shifting greatly, um, particularly in the Western culture, is that we're we're seeing massive burnout. We're seeing, uh, certainly with the pandemic, uh, you're, you're you have seen and will see a lot of mental health issues, which just really w wasn't anywhere near the um, the size we're we're seeing now. And and so you know, part of the power of leadership is is really to be one self aware. And second, to really observe your pace throughout the day. We as humans weren't wired to do the, the, the intense multitasking and the intense um, high interrupt work environments, et cetera. And so what Questage does is really working with leaders is, is allowing them to really find and give themselves permission to find that pause, right? And to be able to have um, uh, time to self-reflect. Um, and what we're discovering is, is that when leaders are able to do that and tap into their intuition, better solutions actually result. And team members are more excited to be around that leader because they're, they're, they're slowing down, they're adjusting, they're being curious, right? And, and the real secret weapon, I think, in today's management and leadership world is, is really about curiosity management, right? Um, to be able to to make it a team sport and to extend the knowledge what's you know originally through your between your two ears and 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 take it out to the team and really cultivate innovative possibility thinking that can produce a much better result definitely and i, I think probably one of the phrases i dislike the most at the moment is to say uh, you should be working on your business not in your business and my problem with that phrase is the fact that 90 percent of people 95 percent of people who say it don't understand it uh and right, they don't right, live it. right 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 so it, right. it's a good intention to have but uh like with, with the people i'm working with and coaching like uh, i see the difference like it's so fundamentally different right when when people are actually working on their business and it's much more for me 
it's much more taking that step back and it's not just a time to reflect but it's it's understanding what's really important because right. as you say we like going 60 miles an hour and the problem is you can't go 60 miles an hour on the important things you can go right. 60 miles an hour on the stuff right. that you know how that's to right. do that's right and that's what people that's right. do they spend you that's know right. hours sitting staring at their mailbox they spend hours right. you know right. doing right. silly stuff that other people right. in the organization could do could do easily yeah and i we really define leadership in a holistic way it's not just how you lead at work but it's how you lead at home how you lead with your family and how you lead in your community so we you know we really we want to extend that definition because in our in in my belief leadership is is on 24 7 and um uh, we in our in our last book with uh, co-author Guy Parsons, we we developed a, a quiz that really talked about the spectrum around uh, what we call a knower leader versus a learner leader. And, you know, the, the knower leader is really the old command and control, the general do as I say, direct, make it happen, leave your emotions at, at the door before you come in and and let's get some good work out. <clears throat> and, you know, that served, um, you know, in the Western culture, you know, back in my grandfather's and father's generation. But the new worker coming in um, and will be coming in, the millions of them are demanding more of that learner leader, which is more of the guide um, that has that curiosity and has their ego in check so that if they don't know the answer, um, they, they're willing to be vulnerable to say, that's OK, you know what, we'll find it will find it and it humanizes that leader so that the sandbox gets extended, as I said earlier, around being able, able to cultivate a curious based culture in an entrepreneurial business or organization that taps into all that intellect. You know, the, the millennials coming in, they recognize they don't have the experience of their elders, but they want to be at the table. They want, they're hungry to learn. And so we need to be creating those kind of cultures that have those learning uh environments you know i i don't know if you saw this it's still stunning to me uh, it was titled in april in the states the um the great resignation we had four million people in one month quit <laughs> their jobs and then in may we had two million million people do that since something's brewing now i guess with the pandemic and a lot of people are stressed and particularly in the services industry but you know, if we think back to where work was, you know, 50 years ago, this is amazing what's happening. And it's really going to force entrepreneurs and organizations to get it right in order to attract and retain the best talent. So it's really, yeah. we're, we're in change times, right? Totally. And I, I, I mean, it's a horrible situation, but I see a lot of positive come out on the other side. Because first of all, the pandemic have forced a lot of people to spend a lot more time at home and right. actually reflect over their life. Correct. And I see many, many people who have made very big decisions that I believe will be uh, e extremely beneficial for them longer term, right? Absolutely. Because they've actually yeah. had that time to sit and reflect that when you're going 60 miles an hour every day That's or right. day, That's right. you don't have that time, right? right? That's right. And in April, Bloomberg came out with a fascinating uh, research. I think they called it... Um, um, I can't remember what the term was, but it's sort of like life is short mentality. And people who were not thinking of retirement are now retiring because they're just done. You know, now in the States with the economy currently, um, you know, some people are in good positions with homes and their investments to be able to do that. But it was, you know, a couple million people. And, and, and that's fascinating to me that the really, you know, are we to a place now where we're really looking at the quality of, of what we do and is it really serving us from a legacy perspective and and when we put our head down on the pillow at night are we feeling good for what we did are we just simply with the red li red light saying you're out of gas <laughs> and and then reset the next morning and that's so, so actually to that point i think one of the things i've seen a lot is that when you are looking at the older generation one of the challenges i see is that a lot of them you know they've spent many years looking forward to to their pension and not having to work. Now, majority of them deeply regret leaving the workforce. Uh, they, they, it, they might wanna scale down a bit, but when you go from working every single day That's right. to just sitting at home staring into your TV for That's many, right. many people, that That's means right. that you get 
I mean, they get five years older every year, right? That's right. Just That's in right. the inactivity. And, and I see... I see so much good potential because like lots of these people have so much great experience. They have so much great knowledge to share. Right. And I see so much good experience that, you know, could be used so much better. And, and maybe it's even a question, you know, working a bit less for a few years earlier, but right. then actually being able to continue and contribute for a longer period of time. Right. That's right. That's right. Well, it's funny you say that because three years ago, um, I just woke up with this epiphany. My early on career was as a career consultant, really working with executives. And in order, it was in San Francisco, California, and in order to work with us, the company that was letting the executive go had to afford the service for them. And I'll never forget um, meeting this one man who was probably about 60 years old, and there was two CFOs, and it was an acquisition, and he didn't get the job. And he had a beautiful resume. And yet when I met him and with no business card left, no title, there was no there there. His entire identity had been his work. And so that's actually where we created Questage, uh, made up word, question, stage, and age uh, to be able to really now shift and help um, leaders who are now finishing their full-time careers and helping them create compelling roadmaps for the many decades of productivity they have left. You know, think about, you know, what our our parents or grandparents did, you know, at least in the States that was fishing or golfing or knitting or whatever. Well, that's different for the baby boomers, right? We are, um, we're very unique in the fact that we want to be highly relevant. We want to be self-aware. We want to be productive. And, you know, the days of fishing are, are you can do it as a hobby, but it's not going to be full time. And and furthermore, we need them to stay. We need that knowledge that, all, you know, they have such wisdom. And, and I wish we did a better job, you know, revering our elders versus sort of letting them cast out. Because uh, certainly for big corporations, who's going to own the culture with all these, you know, folks that have been there for 20 or 30 years going away so um so it's, a, it's exciting time really and then I, I mean i've spent a lot of time all around the world and I've, I've really seen how different cultures treat elderly right uh unfortunately in denmark where i'm from we see a lot of elderly people you know they get up to a certain age they go into an elder folks home and then people is like oh yeah you know we'll, we'll go and visit grandma once a month or something right but right. it's literally just like they're parked in a place where that's right. time goes really, yeah. really slow. Right? Yeah, it's horrible. It's horrible. And seeing, like, I've spent a lot of time in Asia, for example, and I, I love the concept where, you know, like, and obviously it's a different culture, but a lot of the time the grandparents are the ones taking care of the kids. A lot right. of the time the grandparents yeah. are the ones supporting yeah. while the parents go right. out and work and are busy right. doing other things. And, right. and that means that the kids are actually learning not from a 18 or 20 or 22 year old mom all the time, That's right. That's but right. they're learning right. from someone who is generations older yeah. and, yeah. and have a, yeah. a different way of raising kids. Right. Which That's right. I find, I, I found it very inspiring to be honest. Uh, I don't Agreed. have any kids of my own, but I find that way of like the, the elder people, fit into the culture they're not just like that's right somewhere and then right you know, oh, we that's have right. to go and say hello yeah and i hope we can do a better job with that one of the things that we're seeing in the states which is fascinating because uh, boomers are very learned they want to continue to learn is that that universities are now putting retirement facilities on their campus and everyone that's in the retirement has full access to classes right how cool is that, right? To be that able is to, to, you know, and and we we live long when we have purpose and productivity, and we have a mindset of positivity, and we live short when we're feeling unplugged and letting the technology scare us to death, and and that's where we, you know, go back to the rocking chair. So, so we're 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 really on this because we think it's so important um, to change the narrative um, because there's a willingness to to be productive in what we call the the third act of life. I, I, I love that concept because one, one of the things that I see a lot, and, and I mean, I, I have to be upfront, I, I'm not the biggest fan of, of most modern schooling and so on. But one of the big problems I see is the fact that the people teaching you have never done it. They've right. written a book how to do it. That's right. That's but they've right. never done it. 
But if you actually have people with experience in doing things, that's right. Uh, not that's not right. necessarily teaching, but even in a classroom or even around you, right? Like, you that's know, right. if you're if you're studying to become an engineer and you're 18, 20 year old, and you know, you ha- you you are at the same campus as someone in the 50s or 60s or 70s, that's right. who have been an engineer right. for 40, 50 years. Like that's, that's right. so much knowledge, right? Like it is, and we'll have some challenges of that because we're going to have organiz- bigger organizations that are. You may have a manager who's thirty-five with an employee who's seventy, right? And you know that's we've got three or four generations that can be coming together and work. As while some some are retiring, we also have sort of the tale of two cities. While some are retiring, there are, you know a third of baby boomers say that they'll work well into their seventies or always because they need to financially. So that that's going to also have an amazing impact on culture when you have you know uh, three or four generations all under one roof. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, I mean, I experienced in sort of my mid twenties when I was in leadership role, having to let go of someone in the mid sixties, um, mm, and that wow. was. I found that def- definitely difficult. Wow. Um, well, wow. I've, 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 I've been lucky enough to manage lots of people in all age ranges. And right. I've right. I've always really enjoyed it. And I mean, I've, I've been a coach now for probably nearly 10 years and I've worked with people twice my age. Right. Uh, I've right. definitely learned that, you know, people have their strength in different areas. And I, I've been able to help, you know, people who have been executives for, for many years with, with certain particular aspects, right? That's right. That, that That's right. I, I, I enjoy, like, again, as you said, when, when you're working with learners who are That's eager right. to learn, That's it's, right. it's always an enjoyment, right? It is. It is. And that's my focus for yeah, the 25 years really has been really working with top performing leaders. And people say, why do they want to coach? It's because they invest in themselves. They never... They never sort of get there. I, you know, look at the infinity signal or the symbol, excuse me, uh, the sideways aid. And that's always that beautiful dance between student and master and back to student and master. And if we just hang out on the master and thinking we're done learning, uh, that's a sad story. Definitely, definitely. And then I, I think like at least the environment I'm in and a lot of people I'm surrounded by who are also very entrepreneurial and learners and so on, like we love coaches for everything right like when <laughs> right. i when i'm thinking of right. going to the gym i'm like you know if i go and i use the equipment wrong and i'm more likely to get injured it will take me like 10 times as long getting the results i much right. rather pay someone to come and coach me at least for a month or two so i That's get right. the basic right yeah. and you know like and i i look at it like that with most things that when i'm learning new skills or even even to do things like simple things like uh, take housework right i don't right. necessarily want to right. coach for that i want someone doing it because right. that's right. not my thing but that's but right. but that whole investment in the things that that puts you in a better position as a human being i think is is very interesting and i i see that happening a lot lot more right agreed agreed um and you know i, I really believe we all have a calling right and and um, and that calling can be tied to purpose, and that purpose can be tied to legacy that you can look back at at the end of the at, at the end of the journey. And um, you know, we we need we've got a lot of challenges right now in our world, so we really need the leadership conversation, that narrative, to stay alive and stay focused. And and um, you know, um, I'm, I'm happy to be a change agent in this conversation. Definitely, and and I mean, I, I love working with leaders. I think the more leaders there is the better i think the more people develop leadership skills the better i I don't necessarily believe you have to be in a management role to be a leader i think it's something you can be in in anything but i think that ability like take charge of your family take charge of your take charge of your own life right so you you said early on that you know a leader is a leader 24 7 and I'm I'm a firm firm believer in that, right? Like, yeah. I, I've known people that was, you know, like, okay, when I go into the office, I'm gonna be strict. I'm gonna be like this. Right. I'm be That's like right. This. And when I'm outside work, I'm a totally different yeah. human being. And, yeah. And I I can't do it. Like. That's right. I am who I am, and I live. That's right. Like, the way I look at leadership is like, being a leader, you have to live your values, whatever Correct. they are. Correct. Right? And for me, that's, that's like. Yeah. When people see me outside yeah. work, I'm the same. 
Same, so that's right. Focus on the same. I have the same. That's right. right. One head, one heart. So it's all about your, you know, what you're pointing to is the consistency of leadership and it, it should not change. Right. You know, with who you are. I, in, I think it's not just the consistency of leadership, but the consistency of a person, because again, for, for me to trust people, you know, if they show up one way, one day, and another, that's right. Another like, day, who are you? Yeah. Who's the real you to trust? Them. That's right. Yeah. And, and the new generation of worker is requiring that transparency and want to see that authenticity in, in the, in the, in the leader. And, and um, you know, there's, there's an amazing story that it was so powerful. I, I actually told it in two of my books uh, around uh, Bill uh, Gross, who's a very successful uh, guy in the investments. He was chairman of PIMCO now, but when he was on the floor, you know, back in the day, he had just this unbelievable ability to predict the, you know, the bonds market. And, and people are like, well, how, how can he be so, you know, like, how does he do that? And so folks came in to interview and he certainly had a corner office with a success, but there were no fluorescent lights. There was no desk, no computer. There was a couch and a couple of chairs and he would go in there 20, 25 minutes, four times a week and literally unplug and just sort of chill out. And I always said, wow, you know, he was once said that the most important part of his day was his going to the gym after the markets had opened around 930 in the morning. And, and I just thought, well, how much of that success, brilliant success did he have because he was able to pause and really trust intuition and have a mindfulness practice? He's also, also was into yoga. And, uh, you know, 20 years ago, we'd be going, what, what? <laughs> That's crazy. But we're really seeing that integrated leader today who really knows how to, that self-care, you know? Uh, when we think about the priorities of life, is your priority work, then family, then self? Or is it family work or self? Or is it self, family, and work? And if you're taking care of yourself, you're gonna win, the family's gonna win, and your work will absolutely win. But we've gotta to learn to flip it because too many people are um, have, it, have that reversed and it's, uh, it's not a winnable game. Yeah, so so the way I see it is that, uh, that uh, pe people have some natural tendencies, right? So some people always put themselves first. Someone always put others first. And right. uh, I, I think it's it, it, it's not easy to to necessarily reverse it, but the whole thing is being aware of it, right? Correct. So Awareness. You, you definitely, like things like health, right? Like there's no point in you stressing out helping everyone else around you if you're dying, right? That's right. <laughs> that's so, right. so that's right. definitely, or again, giving, handing all your money to someone who needs them and then not being able to buy food for yourself. That's right? correct. That's correct. Again, yep. that's not a, that's not a measure for success in any way, shape or form. Right. So that's right. So there's definitely, there's definitely certain people that need to learn to focus a little bit more on self, particularly around, like for me, the, the key area where I see it is around health, right? That there's definitely some people who don't focus on themselves so much when it comes right. to work and when it comes to, you know, they rather have a colleague, they like get the promotion instead of them. And I, right. I, I can, I can totally, I'm totally okay with that. That the one area where I see it being a big issue is particularly around health, right? Well, and all too often, uh, sadly, it is seeing that executive that is so burned out that the wake up call was the heart attack or the wake up call was a stroke. And, and that's, that's a sad day. And, 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 you know, our bodies, our bodies are messengers. They will let us know, but if we're ignoring it and not feeling it, I mean, then what good is anything? Right. So. It, it come back to a point you said in the beginning though, it's about stopping. The, the problem is yeah. if you're 60 miles an hour all day, every that's day, right. And That's you don't right. stop to think. Now, what happens? Right. Is, now, sometimes it doesn't need to be as bad, but sometimes it's like a family member in a big accident, or sometimes right. you know something happens in life, and people suddenly stop and say, "Wow." That's right. You know, and they suddenly right. realize. I, I, right. I saw a, I saw a very interesting um, study on happiness. Yeah. I saw people who had been in accident and become disabled and had to be in a wheelchair. And actually, uh, three years after the accident, most much, over fifty percent of the people said they were happier after the accident than right. before it. That's right. 
And it was yeah. because they, it was a mix of they have learned to appreciate life or they've learned That's to right. think a lot more about things. And That's I thought right. that was really, really thought provoking. Um, Very. And really something that was worth thinking about as a human being, right? Right, right. You know, it's funny you say that because there's a professor at Harvard uh, a couple of years ago, he had the number one most popular class and it was all on happiness. And his book is actually Happier. And he really spoke about, you know, what we call the rat race. And so many people are in the rat race holding off on happiness just to say, okay, just five more years, just 10 more years, or I, you know, I just need to get to there. And, you know, sometimes we will not have that privilege to get there. So how do we actually, you know, move that into the moment and the presence? Um, and that is really amazing leadership. And people want to be around that. And amazing teams can be created with that kind of energy. Um, and uh, but it does require, you know, eyes open. Definitely. And, and I think I think particular to that, right, like a, a lot of time people use that red race mentality to fool themselves. Right. Mm -hmm. they, they use it in the sense of saying, you know, I'll just work for this five more years. Reality is a lot of the time when you go and talk to people, when you tell what are you going to do in five years? What are you going to do in 10 years? What are you going to do when you right. retire? Most right. of those things they could go do today. Right. But That's they're right. using this illusion for themselves. Like, you know, right. like 20 years ago, people were like, oh, you know, I want to go on a cruise. Right. Nowadays, there's still people saying it, but nowadays going on a cruise costs you a grand or two grand or whatever. <laughs> right. Right. Like, it's a right. possibility. You don't need to yeah. be the richest person. Uh, don't get That's me wrong. Correct. There's people in the world where, where that is impossible. But I'm just saying for a lot of people, they put these sort of fake motivations in front of themselves right. just to right. fool themselves to keep going instead That's of right. stopping up, realizing. And, and I mean, I'm a, I'm a fundamental believer in happiness as a choice, right? And I, I think it's learning to embrace the things around you, but more so uh, actually learning to to own your destiny and, and own your That's situation. That's right, hundred percent. Yeah. So, and particularly if you have a family, the I, I get the stakes get very high for me when you are, um, you know, if you're a sole contributor, you, know, you can choose to do whatever you want. But um, I have so many leaders where I'm like, just let's let's just do a 360 with the family and say how how are you doing with your leadership at home, <laughs> right? How present are you at dinner, right? How unplugged are you from the phone when you get home? How, what's the quality that you're giving those, the, the children, you know, and I, I'm, I'm, you know, back to that student master, when our daughter came into the world, you know, I, I made a conscious choice to work from home because I had an absentee father. So I just said, you know, I, I want to be there for all those moments. And yet there were times where I slipped into that, you know, sort of worker bee mode. And, you know, it's tricky, but, but, you know, um, what are we, what's the messaging we're giving to the next generation of, of leaders if we're not demonstrating that presence and being able to take the pause and, and smell the roses. So I'm with you on that. Definitely. And I think, uh, I think technology brought a lot of wonderful things. I also think it have brought a lot of difficult things. I mean, I've, I've owned one of these mobile phones for many, many years, but yes. I've, for the last 20 years, I've never had sound on mine. I don't ever want to be interrupted. Uh, I don't, uh, a lot of people are not very happy with me for it, <laughs> but, but reality is when I'm sitting having a conversation with friends and I, I don't want the phone that interrupts me all the time, right? Good, good boundaries, uh, very good boundaries. It, it's, <laughs> it's a great tool if I'm in a strange city and I need a map to find a place, it's, it's a tool, right. but you cannot let it run your life. Right? That's correct. And you see a lot of the same stuff with these social medias where, you know, th this is predominant in women, but it also happens to some guys where, you know, if they don't, if they put up a picture of themselves and there's not a certain amount of people pressing a like button, they're running around being, being uh, depressed for, for a day or two, right? And, and all those right. sort of instant gratification things, right. It, it, right. it shows me the same thing, which is people haven't learned to appreciate. Right? That's right. That's right. And the, and, and the tools, you know, technology also can serve. Right? When I have leaders that are learning how to, to pause, they can use their 
watch to have a little beep go off every two hours. And all that does is say presence, right? Or, work, you know, so we can use it to service or, or, or we can use it to, to sort of derail us. So um, I share your perspective very much. Excellent. Well, one thing I want to touch on before we finish, Alan, is uh, Enneagram. Uh, you you yes. mentioned a little bit about that, and I'm by by uh, by many many years, fifteen years plus experience with DISC. I'm a, I'm a huge believer in sort of natural behavior and so on. But uh, I'm always keen on anything that can uh, that can benefit me and others in both helping get to know themselves better, but also the people around them. Right. Well, it's 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 it's. It's the most profound tool. I've worked with DISC and Myers Briggs and Hogan and Strength. I mean, there's a, a wonderful um, auditorium of great assessments and personality assessments that can, that can serve uh, entrepreneurs and, and teams and organizations. But I've been a student of the Enneagram for 25 years, and and I was really frustrated for many years because there was not an accurate questionnaire that could really you know, conclude, um, you know, what, what one's core motivation uh, was. And this uh, amazing company out of Cape Town, South Africa, um, cracked the code. And they have an amazing questionnaire that takes about 25 minutes. Um, I've run it with over 500 leaders with only one person disagreeing with the first time results, which is stunning in the assessment world. And what and it's a holistic system, right? So it really speaks to nine core personalities and it's it, it, or motivations, I should say. And um, it's very comprehensive and it works not only for the leader, but then for the team or the company so that you actually can leverage and understand how each individual, their core motivation, uh, how it's wired. And so you can leverage that to get a lot more uh, and understand, uh, you know, the dynamics uh, around the team. Um, and uh, it, it is, um, it, you know, the integrative Enneagram, um, I think, is the only one I know of uh, that has one that that mastery of accuracy. There are many, many question questionnaires out there, but they they run the risk of, of mistyping. And, you know, the Enneagram has been around for about 10,000 years. We, we track its origins and it was an oral tradition only up until about five or so decades ago. And, um, you know, um, some of the personality instruments when you're working with a team, uh, if you have nine extroverts and one introvert, how's that introvert you know, feeling being a part of the team, right? Or, or nine thinkers and one feeler. And so the beauty of the Enneagram is that we all come with motivations and somewhere around the ages of eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, we pop into one of those nine motivations and it doesn't really leave us. Uh, you're with it for the entire lifetime. And it's just a beautiful, safe, powerful tool. And I'd certainly encourage you to take a peek at it because in my mind, it's it's best in class. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, so so the reason why I latched onto DISC very heavily is the fact that you don't need the test, right? So what I love about DISC is the fact that you you when you learn and, and when you're good right. at it, you just spending a minute with a new person, you can, you That's can right. see their personality straight away, right? And and uh, I, I have the same thing as you. I'm, I'm generally always skeptical of tests and right. uh, but right. particularly... In employment situation, like so many companies use tests in interviews and all that sort of stuff, right? Right. And right. you can twist and turn as much as you want. If you, no matter what you tell people, they will answer the question that they think they want to hear. That you want to hear. That's right. right. And you will also have lawsuits flying around because, like Myers Briggs, if they're using that as an indicator, that has nothing to do with skill and competency, right? So, um, you know, company or, or people have sued for that, saying that's not a fair indicator for me to be able to be considered to work with you. Um, and again, uh, uh, I, you know, you're right on disc because it's a, you know basically observable behavior. Um, and what I love about the Enneagram is, while it does require some time to do it, I think the the depth of it and the accuracy around, um, and then how to use it, right? Um, I'm I'm an Enneagram one, which is the strict perfectionist, right? I'm married to an Enneagram two, who's a considered helper, and and by understanding that, so when I get all anal on, you know, needing to have certain structures, like okay, I know what you're doing there, right? So it gives family systems as well as teams and organizations a context to be able to appreciate 
the uniqueness of our of our humanness. Um, and uh, so it's uh, yeah, it's a powerful tool. And and take a peek at it. I'll, I'll send you over the link after we're done. Awesome, fantastic, Alan. I think that was fantastic. So. Um, any other resources or anything else you would recommend to people here before we finish uh, around leadership and management and so on? Well, I'm often asked, you know, if, if I had to pick out a book for owners and, and people are, that are older, sort of getting into uh, up in the 50s or whatnot. Um, and one of my teachers is Richard Rohr, R-O-H-R, who's just an amazing teacher and philosopher. And, and um, he's... Uh, written a number of books and one of the books I really like that I invite my leaders to look at is a book called Falling Upward and it sort of ties to our conversation Mads because uh, what his stake is is that you know you come into this world as a blob right <laughs> and you you know you get into your family system and you grow up and you get into schooling and then maybe university and and then career and and maybe partners or family and and you know that first half of life is all the doing this right connected to ego um and what he offers is that that second half of life is to shift from the human doing to the human being right and to sort of put that not to put that we need ego but to put that driving ego to the side and really ask the question what really matters you know what what's really important to some of the things we spoke about uh in in this interview and uh, he does a beautiful job of articulating it. and and um you know i think we're at a at an inflection point in our world where we're needing to lower that mirror for each of us and just say what really is important and what's really driving me and 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 what kind of legacy do i want to create that i can go job well done as as i turn the final lap before you know moving upstairs so um, I'd offer that um, as a resource, along with the integrative Enneagram as a, as a personal uh, development tool, as well as a leadership development tool. And, um, and uh, certainly uh, questage.com has uh, resources both on leadership and also about transition. Uh, if people are, if some of your listeners are to a point where they're thinking about the third actor life uh, we have an are you ready uh, quiz that just very quickly sort of assesses their readiness and then we can provide resources whether they're for us or not uh, just to assist them uh, because a lot of people at least in the united states are 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 having to get into retirement without a lot of resources and as i said you really want to change that narrative so that the third actor life is the best actor life awesome Fantastic, Alan. If people are eager to reach out, any other way, what's the best way to get hold of you in general? Really, the only way is to go to the website, questage, quest, Q-U-E-S-T-A-G-E.com. And we've set it up so all resources are there um, and, and contact information. Fantastic. Thank you very, very much for this conversation, Alan. That was fantastic. I enjoyed the dialogue. I like your passion and uh, good luck. Excellent. Thank you. And to the audience, we'll be back again next week. Thank you for hanging on all the way to the end. Thank you for listening to the Mad Singers Management Podcast. Please leave a review. It means the world to us. You can also learn more about management at madsingers.com.